the topic that's been given to me is can truth be perverted and God accept it? Now, I would think because of what Brother Danny spoke about, he does, you know, all, he'd have preached all over on top of my sermon, but he didn't. Because diluting something and perverting something, even though in our minds we kind of go, man, what's the difference? There is a difference. Because when you pervert something, you can leave it at its strength, but you just add something to it, thinking you're going to make it a little bit better. But you're not. If you would, turn to Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 through 9. Paul writes, he says, How marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be a curse. As we said before, so I say now again. If any man preach any other gospel unto you than that which you have received, let him be accursed. We're going to focus on the word pervert. Now, you know, I, I, I get it. We, uh, you think about pervert, we think about a sexual type of thing. But, you know, perversion is just someone or something that has deviated from what is considered right correct, natural, moral, ethical, or its intended function. You know, perversion is changing something from what it is into something that it was not intended to be. Much like what Paul is talking about here. There are some coming and saying they're preaching the gospel and they call it the gospel and yet they're not preaching the gospel. They're preaching something else. It goes back to the law of excluded mills. Something either is or is not. In other words, it can't be the gospel and then you pervert it and it be the gospel. It's something else. And that's the point that Paul is making here. We can change in our society. I, I, I thought about this and it's kind of like goes back to the time Bill Clinton when we define the definition of is. You know, all of us use the word is, and we understand what that means, but he wanted to go back and redefine what the word is, is. And it becomes a joke in a sense, but yet it perverts the very meaning of is. Synonyms for perversion would mean to be corrupt, to lead astray, to distort, to warp, to subvert, to twist, to bend, abuse, divert, deflect, misapply, misuse, misrepresent, misconstrue, falsify, garble, and the words go on and on and on and on. But I think you get the idea of what it means to pervert something. You're changing it into something else. But Paul says, for those who would pervert the gospel, change it into something else, let them be accursed. Now that to me is the interesting word in here in the sense that understanding that there is there's a reward for those who pervert the gospel. The idea of accursed here means to to make anathema or curse them. And it brings about the idea that is something that has been devoted by God without hope of being redeemed. A person doomed to destruction. And if you think about that, that's pretty scary, is it not? I have no hope. If I change the gospel, if I pervert the gospel and, and go about my way saying it's the gospel, God says, you're doomed. Doesn't matter how many followers you have. Doesn't matter how much money you make. Doesn't matter how much good you may do. You perverted the gospel of Christ. 
Therefore, you're cut off. So the question given to us today is, is it false that truth can be corrupted, distorted, warped, twisted, and on and on, and God will accept it? Well, the short answer is no. You cannot pervert the gospel and be acceptable to God. Romans 1 verse 16, it's through the gospel that we have salvation. So if I change the very thing God has given us to give me salvation, then what have I got? It's not salvation, it's damnation. So let's think about some things that are going on today. You look around us today, and we see so many ways or so many examples of this playing out before our very eyes. Some call it an affair, and yet it is truly adultery. They perverted that word. They changed it into something else. And I think about an affair, I think about a picnic or going to some kind of social or what we had here this morning. I know that's a fellowship among Christians, but the point is, that's what I think about an affair. Let's go to the affair. Safe sex is nothing more than fornication. Gay love and all that that means is sodomy, homosexuality, condemned by God. Veneration and the idea of, of the statues and the praying to Mary and all these kind of different things that people do, God calls it idolatry. Oh, I'm just going to tell a little white lie. Just a little one. Just a little one. It's no big thing. God calls it sin. It's a lie. Some say pro-choice. But all that really truly is is pro-murder. That's all it is. Some call it social drinking, and it's nothing more than drunkenness. And folks, we got it going on right now because war Mardi Gras is in full swing. A lot of people being a part of that. Some say, well, you know, the guy, give him a break. He just made a mistake. No, he sinned. A mistake is something you had no intention of doing and something happens from it. But a lot of people willingly enter into sin, follow down that road. Well, you know, it's just evolution or ev theistic evolution or whatever you may want to call it. No, it's creation. God created. Well, it's just, that's one of those gray areas. You know, I don't like you people being so black and white about things. No. When God says something, I do it. There is no gray area. And on and on, the dumbing down of, of God's word continues. I don't know if you, well, I don't know if all of you do. I know some of you do. Keep up with politics. I don't keep up with as much as I used to, but I do sometimes like to follow this lady because I get a good laugh. If I'm in a bad mood or feel down or something, this is a good lady to listen to. Uh... I forgot her first name, but it's uh, Casio Cortez. I want you to think about something. I wrote this quote down verbatim in an interview that she gave. And it's not a long quote, but I want you to think about what she says. She says, you know, I think there's a lot of people more concerned about being precise about being factual and semantically correct than they are about being morally right. Now think about that. Now, first of all, she got elected. So the trouble doesn't lie with her. It lies with her constituents that put her in office. But this is the darling of the Democratic Party, the up-and-comer. And if you want to know where the Democratic Party is headed, pay attention to what she says. She's going to be running that place for long. 
But the whole mindset, you know, she says something and then they come back fact-checking her. And she says, well, you know, you people are so worried about facts. You want me to be so semantic. In other words, you want me to say the right words so that you can follow me. You people, you're worried about the wrong thing. You just need to be morally right. Well, folks, I'm saying this. If you can't figure out factually how to talk and how to keep your facts and, and being precise, then how can you be moral? Because you've lost a, There's a disconnect there. And there obviously is, because she, along with others, are very pro-murder of our babies, all the way up until the point of delivery. So what is morally right? Well, in her mind, it probably means something completely different than what it means to us, because it obviously would not be guided by the word of God. She's perverted the word of God. And I don't leave the Republicans alone because I'm just as saddened by their activities, too. They are not the Republican Party they used to be. Because of their inaction, as well as their unwillingness to stand up for what's right, this country is going where it's going. And not a whole lot we can do other than vote as a group, as a people, and hopefully one day this thing will separate itself out. But let's think about all that and the idea of this. You know, we wonder, do we, do we not wonder at times why it could be so bad? And yet, you listen to, here's a young person that's telling us, y'all are worried too much about the facts, about the truth. You need to quit worrying about those things. Quit fact-checking me. Quit worrying about what I'm saying. But you know, there was a time, not even 4,000 years ago, that our world found itself in the same state as we see now. Moses wrote in Genesis 6 and verse 5, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth. And that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was on evil continually. That's the world we live in today. And yet it was still going on. It happened 4,000 years ago also. So it gives us some hope in the sense of understanding that it goes in cycles. Now it may not be before a lot of us are off this earth that it may swing back where it needs to be. And who knows, it may never swing back. And God's patience gives up just like he did in the time of Noah. He destroys the world. But all of this we need to understand. That God views man the same way he did in the time of Noah that he does now. But there are various ways that man corrupts or perverts the truth in the Bible. It was alluded to and talked about a little bit by Brother Danny, but in Revelation 22 and verse 19, we're told not to take away or add to. Don't pervert God's word. We're told in Deuteronomy 5 and verse 32, don't turn from the right or the left from God. And in Deuteronomy 4 and verse 2, it says not to add to or diminish aught from God's word. And I always, have always thought this, and it's very interesting to me, that that same admonition is given to us from the Old Testament and the New. And that brings to my mind very clearly that God obviously expected man to do exactly what he told him to do. Exactly what he told him to do. No matter what dispensation we may be under. But... <clears throat> In the Old Testament, we have many examples of those who changed or perverted God's word. We're not going to be able to cover every situation, but I want to name a few just to kind of go over them. Maybe some things we can learn from them we haven't thought about. What about Adam and Eve in Genesis 3? You know, in verse 3, Eve accurately gave back, talked to, communicated exactly what God told them regarding that tree. 
She knew God's command regarding that tree, that they were not to eat from it. So she can't claim, well, I was ignorant. She can't claim, well, I didn't have a brain. She can't claim, well, you didn't communicate clearly enough to me. No, she told Satan, God said don't eat of that tree. And all Satan did was change one word. He added one word. Thou shalt not surely die. And as we know then, Adam also received this command. And he took of the fruit and then both of them were condemned for their actions. Because now they had sinned against God. <clears throat> and like all of us at one time or another... Pointing finger, well, it's his fault. Well, it's her fault. And ultimately, it turned around to where they began to blame God. It's this woman that you gave me. That's why this happened. And what gall, what ignorance, what pity that we should have for Adam and Eve in, in doing this, but yet man is no different than today. We hear the old saying, the devil made me do it. We have those who say, well, if my parents had not made me eat broccoli, well, you know, I wouldn't be this way. If they had not spanked me, if they hadn't corrected me, if they hadn't done all these things, then, you know, I'd be a different person. Some say, well, you know, my friends, you know, they kind of got involved in this, and, you know, I didn't want to be different, so I just kind of went along with them. On and on the excuses continue. Yet it is we as human beings who pervert the word of God. In Genesis 19 and verse 17, we have a second situation where Lot and his wife, they were told in verse 17 to escape for their life. Do not look behind, but go to the mountain, lest you be consumed. As we know, the account of Lot and his wife, his wife looked back and said that, she was told directly, do not look back. And yet in verse 26 of Genesis 19, she looked back and was turned to a pillar of salt. This idea of looking back is not just kind of looking over your shoulder. She looked back with an attitude of favor or care. She really didn't want to go. And because of that, she directly disobeyed what was said and paid the price. And the word of God was perfect, complete, but she did not obey. Today, people are not much different. God tells us that we're to purify ourselves. Don't love the world, hate evil. And yet while we look around and we see all the things that people are doing, it's obvious they're not doing what God commanded them to do. In 1 Chronicles 13 and verse 5, beginning there and continuing on through there, it says, The ark then was taken out to war, to battle, which was directly against what God would have wanted them to do, but they did it anyway. They take it out to battle, and then ultimately <laughs> they lose the war in the ark gets taken away from them. Now remember where the ark was. It was in the Holy of Holies. This represented the mercy of God, the, who God was, his presence. And they took, first of all, they took it, it took it out to a battle, and then they let it get taken from them. Well, later on, as time goes on, they found the ark. And so David says, we need to build a new cart. You know, you can't have an old cart. You need to do a new cart. I mean, this is the ark. We've got to carry it in style, you know. When the cart was built, the ark was put up on it. And when it was just about to fall from the cart, Uzzah reached out to catch it, to stable it. That's all he wanted to do. He just wanted to make sure it didn't get dropped on the ground. Picture this scene. 
They had the new cart. It says that they're out there dancing around and carrying on. In other words, they are jubilant. They're very happy. This is the day that the ark gets brought back to us. There's music. There's merriment galore. Everyone is so happy. But someone died. Someone died. You see, they perverted God's word. It should bring to, air, to the heart of every person that reads from the New Testament that when God says to do something, God expects it to be done. In the way that he has commanded it, and only the way he's commanded it. And you know, it says then in verse 12, which I find interesting, you know, they have all the party and all this thing going on. And then Uzzah dies. And then it says, then David was afraid of God. You see, David forgot who, whose ark that was. David forgot. How did all this come about? Well, first of all, in 1 Chronicles 13, verse 1 and following, it started out, he went and consulted the wrong people as to how to move the car. He went and talked to his people, you know. Here's the king. He has the ability to talk to God through prophets. And what does he do? He goes and just talks to his people. And they say, well, you know, we got a good idea. Let's just make a big production of this. Let's just have a good time for everyone. Let's have a party. Let's do all this kind of stuff. Let's build a brand new cart. You know, that's, that's the end all. Let's have this new thing. Then in 1 Chronicles 15 and verse 1, after Uzzah had to die, after a time, then David does it the right way. How do he know how to do it? Obviously, he consulted the word of God. He does what the law commanded. The only people who had the sole custody, the sole ability to do anything with this was the Kohathites. So he gets them around. And they're not to carry it on a cart. They carry only long poles. And they carry it. And no one else is to bother with it. And then he calls for it to be moved by them, and then true happiness is shown. Nobody else had to die because they did it the way God commanded it to be done. They changed and perverted God's word, and Uzzah paid the price. You know, today we see all manner of things going on in the religious world. We look around, we see bands and dancing and swaying and clapping and carrying on within what... Many say are worship services. The names people wear as people of God. I'm a Baptist Christian. I'm a Methodist Christian. I'm a this. I'm a that. None of those men from the 16, 13, 14, 15, 1600s, none of those men died for this church. Jesus Christ did. We can't put somebody else's name on the Lord's church or on the Lord's people. The doctrines that so many teach today, perversions of God's word. You know, they water it down as was dealt with last, but you know, when God says you must believe, a lot of people say, well, I believe. Do you truly believe? Do you understand what it means to have faith in God? Well, God spells it out for us in the word of God, what it means to have true, honest faith. And yet so many today say, well, I believe. I believe. Millions die today, every year dying in their perversions of God's word. Thousands of denominations spring up perverting the word of God. And it continues to go on. 
Jeremiah 36 and verse 23, the word of God was cut up and burned. You know, the king, he sat there and had him allow, allowed him to read what was put down, and he didn't like it. So what did he do? Took out his pen knife, cut the word of God up, and threw it in the fire. That word was given directly from God to the prophet, and the prophet wrote it down and then took it to the king. And the king cut it up and threw it in the fire. What arrogance. What an attitude of rebellion. But today, we look around us and what do we see? People picking and choosing what they want to do or not do. And sadly, this is ha even as has been talked about often through this lectureship, you know, even our own brethren in this way. You stand up here and preach from the word of God. Give a thou shalt not. And some people will do. And some people say, eh, what's the big deal? And go on about their life. They take their own knives to God's word, cutting out what they refuse to listen to or obey. Taking words and redefining them. Changing them to suit their ideas. Using their Bibles as props so that it shows that they're Christians and yet they very seldom ever study it. Very seldom ever look in it and read from it what God would have them do. What difference are we at times than Jehoiakim who cut the word of God into pieces? We move on to the New Testament. You know the Pharisees have been alluded to many times through this Lectureship, they made their own man-made laws often. Equivalent in their mind with God's law. In fact, it even superseded in some cases. You see, they're perverting the word of God. They're teaching another gospel. Washing of their hands. Working on the Sabbath. Performing miracles on the Sabbath. All these kind of things that were constantly things that they brought, accusations against Christ and his disciples. And when it all came down, Matthew 15 and verse 9, they're teaching for doctrines, their commandments of men. They're perverting the word of God. Matthew 15 and verse 9, their, their religion is vain. And in our text today in Galatians 6, verse 1, verse 6 through 9, in the context, we're looking at Paul writing to the Galatian brethren. Obviously, the Judaizing teachers had come in. They're beginning to teach a lot of different things that are contrary to the will of God. And one of the things is, is they're trying to say, well, you know, you Gentiles, if you really want to be Christians, you need to be circumcised. If you want to be a Christian, then you've got to take part in our feast days and our holy days and all these other kind of things that they were bringing over from the old law into the gospel they were perverting God's word and Paul had to write them and tell them you cut those people off you do what I commanded you to do The gospel, Romans 1 and verse 16, is the only thing that's going to save man. And when man changes or corrupts or misapplies God's word, it will only lead to destruction. Is it false that truth can be converted and God accepted? If we can pervert the word of God, we are anathema to God. We just have to look, we just have to look at a few of the many scriptures that teach God's word must be changed, uh, must not be changed in any way or man will be held accountable. We live in a world that has no problem changing God's word to suit whatever group we may be a part of. Our jobs, our obligations today is do not add or take away from God's word. 
And you cannot allow our friends or our wants or our desires to cloud what God has commanded. And if we do, we will not be going to heaven. We will be eternally cut off from God. Begin Matthew chapter 7 and verse 21. Not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven... Many will say to me that day, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and have we not cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? To man's estimation, these were good people. They've done some good things. But Jesus said, I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. These people had their own idea as to how they would serve God. They did not follow God's will. And therefore, they were told to depart. I have two quotes that I found. I found them very interesting. I, I pondered on them whether I wanted to use them or not, and I put them in here. But I want you to think about this. It says, truth will always be truth. Regardless of, of lack of understanding, disbelief, or ignorance, the truth will always be the truth. And then secondly, the truth is incontrovertible. Controvertible. Malice may attack it, ignorance may deride it, but in the end, there it is. And as we think about the truth, we've been talking about this for this is the third day now. God's word is truth. And therefore, we must do only what God commands. And if we add to that or take away from it or if we water it down or change it in any way, what we follow from then on is not the word of God. Thank you for your time.